and uh, oh, there we go. Um, sorry, let me get that going. Um, and he wrote about um, his experiences in the prison camps, um, and he wrote he wrote beautifully. So. Um, so that's what this is about. But he, this is an Oakland group, and we'd also like to talk about um, how he came to California and his work in Oakland. Um, he was a member of the city council, and he was an important part of early Oakland. He knew a lot of important people here, um, and he um, he's important for so many reasons um, in early California history. So. Um, so I'm a biologist. Um, my dad is a historian. Um, he's right now. My dad is joining us from Oklahoma, where um, he's a retired uh, professor of American history. Um, and so I want you all to know that when I was a kid, I spent my school summer vacations going to every Revolutionary War and Civil War battlefield in the country. You know, because that's what we did, you know, dad would say, okay, summertime, let's go see some battlefields. Um, so um, I'm a biologist. Um, I am not a historian. Um, this is where I work. I work at Cal. A lot of you have been there. A lot of you probably graduated from Cal. This is the Valley Life Sciences building on campus. Um, if you've ever been to Cal or come for Cal Day, if you know where the T-Rex uh, statue is or, or skeleton, that's where I am. So this is our famous T-Rex. It's one of 28 in the world. Um, the stairwell behind it is supposed to look like the curve of a DNA molecule. But if you turn around from where this photographer took this picture, right behind you is the entrance to the herbarium. Um, so we actually have two herbaria at uh, UC. This called the University and the Jepson Herbaria. The Jepson focuses only on California plants. Um, so a lot of you may not know what is a herbarium. Um, so if you go into this building, what you will see, um, it's all underground and it's row after row of compactorized um, storage cabinets. Um, and what you have when you open up those cabinets are flat file folders full of plant specimens. Um, and the way we do this is, um, all of these specimens are organized by family and they're pressed and preserved and, and hopefully they're here for generations to study for years on end. Um, so the way these plants are collected is you go out in the field and I actually have with me my plant press, which is, these things are enormously heavy. Um, this is what they look like. It's basically a bunch of blotter paper with cardboard in between them. And then you cinch it down with these straps and you press the plants and then you put the whole thing in a low oven to let it dry. Um, and then they're preserved um, and they can last for centuries if bugs don't get them or water or anything like that. Um, the picture on the left is Willis Jepson for whom the Jepson Herbarium is named. Um, there's also a famous guide to the flora of California called the Jepson Manual. Um, some of you here have worked on that, Mike Simpson. Um, so, um, and now on the right is a picture of uh, the legions of undergraduates that we employ um, preparing specimens and cataloging them and that kind of thing. Um, so, um, herbaria got started probably in the Middle Ages in Europe, um, and originally they were a repository for apothecaries and hospitals and monasteries where medicine was actually delivered. And it was important to have a, a physic garden where they knew what kind of medicinal plants would be there. And then they would preserve those specimens so that if you were ever out collecting, you could say, oh, this plant is good for this malady or whatever. Um, and during the Renaissance, they became formal gardens. But that's, that's where herbaria really started. It's just a record of what was growing and what was good for people. Um, Herbarium specimens today are still incredibly valuable, but for a lot of different reasons. Um, we can get DNA out of them now, um, and so that's important to know how plants are changing through time. Um, also, it's a good historical record. We know what plant was growing where and in, under what conditions, and we can go back now, or people 100 years from now can go back to these same locations and see is the plant still there. Um, and these are important for historical records for how climate change is going to change the habitat. So they're really, really valuable collections. Um, my very first day working at the herbarium, 
um, you know, I had gone through the HR thing where I had talked to all the people about benefits and I was getting a tour of the herbarium and the guy who was showing me around opened up a closet. It was literally a, a tiny dark broom closet. And he said, oh yeah, this is where we keep the field journals. And field journals are important because it's where the collector actually writes down um, the data that go with the plant. And a, a specimen is useless without the data. And so um, there were journals from all sorts of famous collectors. And he said, and then we've got this weird thing. And this, this book was sitting in a Corona beer box. So, you know, the, like a case of beer, the boxes that they come in. This book was just sitting there on the top and he said, this is kind of interesting. This is from Lemon. And um, I looked at it and I vaguely knew who Lemon was um, because I, you know, like many of us, I'd been up to Tuolumne Meadows in Yosemite and there's this brilliant pink uh, paintbrush flower that carpets Tuolumne Meadows. And I knew that was called Lemon's paintbrush. But beyond that, I didn't really know who he was. I, I was trained as a geneticist, you know, I was just like, okay. Um, and I opened it up and this is what it fell open to. And it's, um, it's got this picture of this man in a union civil war uniform and it says hospitals and battles and prisons and register. And it's in this old fashioned scrawly pen and ink. And I open up the first page and it says Kilpatrick Circuit of Atlanta. Um, and I'm like, what the heck is this thing? Um, I didn't know who Kilpatrick was. Um, and then on the right hand side, there's this newspaper column print that's pasted over what looks like some more scrawly handwriting. And then I just sort of held the book open. And by the way, this book was kept under a sheet of VizQueen because at the time uh, they were doing repairs on the roof and they were trying to protect it from water seeping in. It's like an archivist's worst nightmare how this stuff was, was preserved. Um, Cause you know, we take care of the plant specimens but we didn't do such a good job with the actual records. Um, and the book falls open to this thing. And this is a hand-drawn pencil map of Andersonville prison. Now, I did know what Andersonville was. I'm the daughter of a historian. I, I know what Andersonville is. And so my eyes started popping out of my head because I thought, this is crazy. This guy was in Andersonville. Um, and I started reading a little bit over here on the left and he's giving his account of what it was like to go into Andersonville prison. Um, and I'll just read one paragraph and he says, giving one more despairing look at the outer disappearing world with a gasp of horror, you approach the first high wall and massive gate. It slowly opens on its hinges at the bidding of your leader. You are pushed through by the attendant guards, half stifled by the hot fetid air and the gate closes behind you with a clang. Um, and so, and he goes on and on about this, about his experiences in Andersonville. And then I look a little bit more and there's another prison page that I had never heard of. And so, you know, my daughter of a historian mind is reeling. So I get home that night and I call my dad in Oklahoma and I say, dad, you're never gonna believe what I, what I found at work today. Um, and it's, it's a civil war diary and it's from a guy who was in Andersonville. This is amazing. What do you think? <laughs> and dad, do you wanna talk about what you said? All right, I wasn't very interested. <laughs> I had a major project going that took five years and all of my time and, and more. And so far as I was concerned, I, I, I really enjoy the civil war. I like to read about the civil war, but more has been written about the civil war than any other subject in American history. And I don't think there's much new that can be added. Uh, and, and consequently, uh, Kelly badgered me for the better part of, I think, six months uh, and until my project ended and I really didn't have much else to do. So I, I took a look at it. And Kelly is really right. John Gill Lemon was a gifted writer. Uh, his, his prose is just excellent. Uh, he, he catches the mood. And I, uh, 
I became a little more interested, but one of the problems with this scrapbook and, and what he has done is he has pasted articles that he has written probably over the handwritten copies of the articles. But in doing that, he neglected to tell us where these articles were published. And that's essential. You, know, you, you, you can't write without knowing where it's coming from. Uh, and that, that's just bedrock in history. And if you look at the page on the left, you will see that there is a considerable amount of bleed through. And we literally spent hours with mirrors reading the reverse side, trying to figure out where these articles were published. And finally, we decided they were near his home in Michigan. We thought they were printed in Ann Arbor, and we narrowed it to a couple of newspapers, but the Peninsula Courier and Family Visitant was the one that was most likely. Well, I tried to borrow it. It's, it's only in about four or five uh, libraries in the entire country, and not one would loan it. And so I contacted University Microfilms and discovered they had it for an exorbitant sum of money. And uh, I, I wrestled with the decision for quite some time, but I decided if I'm going to go on with this, uh, I, I need to know where these articles were published. And so we gambled and uh, we ordered uh, three or four or five, I've forgotten how many rows of microfilm from University Microfilms. And I put the first one in praying that it would be, and I, I chugged through a while and lo and behold, the, the place that I stopped, stopped on this page with uh, the, the second number of a whole series that concerns his imprisonment. The, there are the articles that are in that book that, that Kelly showed you. Uh, and uh, I was absolutely elated. There was a little bit more information there as well, but we, we really had made a, a major breakthrough. And uh, the, the sad part of this is that later, Google published this online and you can now get all of this information for free uh, from Google Books or, or, uh, or Google newspapers. The, in, in reading all of this material from Lemon, uh, we decided that he had written a diary and we searched all over the place. Well, the, actually, the, the very first thing I did is a literature search to make sure uh, that Lemon was worth writing about. You know, if, if people had already exhausted him, there was no reason for me to trod or, you know, to plow plowed ground. And I did not find anything at all about Lemon. He was virtually unknown, which is really good. And, and at this point, my goal was to write two or three articles about his Civil War experiences, and that was it. Uh, but, but I needed to find out where his diaries were, and I wasn't having much luck at all. We looked all kinds of places and, and just came up absolutely empty handed. Well, I was reading Dave Evans' uh, book on Sherman's Horsemen. This is, this is the best book uh, from the cavalry perspective, and Lemon was a cavalryman uh, that uh, you can read, and lo and behold, well into it, there Lemon was. With passages, with quotations, I had never seen. I, I you know, raced to the end notes to find the, you know, where this is coming from. The first two or three didn't even have it. Uh, it was a very difficult process to find out where it was. And finally, I came up with the initial CSMH. What the hell is that? And I finally had to go to the abbreviation index. And it, it, it's, it's California, San Marino, Huntington. And at, at this point, uh, I, I, I went online and looked and found that they had a memoir that he wrote in 1866 
that had a lot of information that we didn't have. Well, Kelly was an awful lot closer to the Huntington than I was. And so we sent her down there. And Kelly, do you want to pick up the story from here? Sure. So um, we knew about the diary from the herbarium at UC, and that was just about his prison work. But this other diary was about the time from the time he enlisted until um, he rejoined his unit. And it's all about how he was assigned a horse and how they did drills. And this is um, one of his diaries where down at the Huntington, where you can see he's drawn um, what the organization of the military camps was like. Um, this is probably when they were waiting to cross the Ohio River on their way south. Um, and then here, um, they spent a lot of time in Nashville, in Tennessee. Tennessee it had been taken back from the Confederates. Um, you can see he's drawn in the Cumberland River, and this is Nashville. And all around Nashville, you can see that there are um, army encampments and, and uh, cannons and fortifications. Um, and so I was able to get the original source for this, um, for this other diary. And nobody, as far as we know, had written about it. Um, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to stop sharing and let my dad pick up sharing and he's made a little video of you uh, or for you of what um, the his Civil War experiences were for Lemon. Okay, and uh, this will take about what, what, five or six minutes, Kelly, I, for, I forgot oh, exactly how much. And let me get to the, move this out of the way. And so if you're a real Civil War buff, you might want to, you know, you can go and learn about it. And this is just going to encapsulate his experiences um, in the Civil War up until he's out of the war. Okay, I'm having a little trouble here. Let me, let me just okay. get that's rid fine. of this and find, okay, that's what I want right here. Oh, we'll rally around the flag, boys, we'll rally once again. John Gill Lemon was a 30-year-old country school teacher in southeastern Michigan when the 4th Michigan Cavalry Regiment was mustered into federal service in August of 1862. After brief training, which involved little more than parade ground close-order drill, the regiment boarded trains in Detroit and steamed south to confront the forces of rebel general Braxton Bragg, who had invaded Kentucky. Before the regiment joined the action, Bragg had ordered a withdrawal. Skirmishes with a rear guard commanded by Confederate Colonel John Hunt Morgan produced few casualties, but the Michigan regiment was decimated by disease. Childhood illnesses and a host of other maladies claimed more lives and put more men out of action than enemy bullets and artillery fire. By late October, Private Lemon had developed a racking cough, chest pains, and a perpetual headache. Constant movement and exposure to the elements worsened his condition, and he was soon confined to the regimental hospital where care and food were in short supply. By this time, with half the men in the regiment unfit for duty, medical personnel were unable to cope with the magnitude of illness. Lemon decided his chances of survival were better out of the hospital. Still seriously ill, he followed his regiment to Nashville. Union medical officials realized that Lemon was in no condition to rejoin his unit and assigned him to hospital duty in the recently liberated capital of Rebel, Tennessee. Although his health gradually returned, he remained in Nashville for more than a year, determined to provide better medical assistance for the wounded and sick than he'd received. After more than a year of detached duty, Lemon persuaded military officials to return him to his regiment, which he rejoined in late April of 1864, just as it made final preparations to break camp at Columbia, Tennessee, and march east to Georgia to support General William Tecumseh Sherman's advance on Atlanta. For the next three months, Lemon was in constant action as the Union advanced on Atlanta. During the final days of the siege of the city, 
the Michigan private participated in a daring cavalry raid commanded by Union General Judson Kilpatrick, who led his command completely around the city, destroying rail lines. Greatly outnumbered and encircled by the rebels on several occasions, the Union force cut its way out of traps by bold saber charges against overwhelming odds. Ironically, a few days after reaching the safety of Union lines, Lemon was captured by Confederate irregulars while he was securing fodder for his horse. He soon found himself in the notorious rebel prison compound at Andersonville, Georgia, where he remained for several weeks before being transferred to the equally brutal but less well-known POW compound at Florence, South Carolina. In late February of 1865, as Sherman's army marched through South Carolina, Confederate guards abandoned their post at Florence, and Lemon and his fellow POWs were liberated. One of the few men able to walk out of the prison, Lemon weighed little over 90 pounds. After a brief leave, he tried to rejoin his unit, but Army officials realized that he was in no condition for active military service. He was discharged as the war came to an end. Lemon returned to his home in Michigan, but most of his family had moved to California following the discovery of gold there. When his physical condition didn't improve, the Michigan veteran sailed from New York for Panama, crossed the Isthmus, and booked passage on another ship for California. Reunited with his family in the High Sierras near Nevada, his health gradually improved, although he never recovered fully from the impact of prolonged malnutrition and the conditions he endured during his captivity. Fascinated by the new plants he encountered in the high elevation of his new home, Lemon's interest in botany was rekindled. He devoted the rest of his life to the study of the flora of California and the American West. Many of the plants of that region now bear his name. He died in 1908 at the age of 76. Until recently, his extensive writings about his wartime experiences have been neglected in the archives of the herbarium of the University of California, Berkeley, by scientists more interested in his specimens and plant notes. Lemon's accounts of his experiences in the war offer insight about medical treatment, the Atlanta campaign, and life in a Confederate prison camp from the viewpoint of an articulate private soldier. Okay, Kelly, do you want it back or do you want me to comment a little bit more? I think I can get it back. Let's okay. see. Okay. Um, okay. So um, that that's a really brief summary of his experiences in the Civil War. He he has gory accounts of the hospitals and all sorts of things, and you can only imagine. Um, but today, you know, we'd probably say that Lemon suffered from PTSD, um, but they didn't recognize it as such back then. Um, but for the rest of his life, he would complain of um, all sorts of ailments. Um, and he seemed to have trouble holding a steady job. He couldn't, um, he couldn't work a day in the field and made himself useless to his brothers who were living in the Sierra Valley. Um, but by gosh, he could get out there and collect plants. And that's pretty much what he did. And I think the plants really were his salvation. They, they gave him something to do and helped him heal. So um, as dad said, he ended up in Sierraville. Um, for those of you who know the High Sierra, this is a, a town in the Sierra Valley, north of Truckee, north of the Lake Tahoe area. Um, so here's a modern map. Um, here's Lake Tahoe, here's Truckee, here's the Sierra Valley, and there's Sierraville right down there at the bottom. Um, this is a broad, open, high Sierra meadow, and there's a whole chain of them that goes all the way up to the Cascades. It's beautiful, beautiful country. Um, and it has wildflowers that are absolutely gorgeous, and most of them during Lemon's time there are com were completely unknown to Western science. Um, so he started hobbling around outside his brother's um, farmstead and picking the plants and trying to figure out what they were. Um, he also was under the care of a physician because he was in pretty bad shape. Um, and this physician was named Dr. Weber. Um, Dr. Weber also owned a hotel that was on one of the major toll roads that went over the Sierra. 
Um, and it was at Weber Lake. Um, and this, this area, you can go there today. It's a beautiful mountain lake. Um, and I want you to look, focus on this building here in the middle where it says um, Weber's Hotel. Um, John Lemon would collect plants in the area and then he would take them to Weber's Hotel and he was a caretaker during the winter there. Um, keep your eye on that building. That building is still there. You can go see it today. It looks like this. <laughs> it's being um, refurbished by the Truckee Donner um, Land Trust and um, that hotel that you know during the summer season when the passes were open um, there were lots of travelers coming to and fro but in the winter lemon was the caretaker in the mid 1870s and he was the only person up there and he used the long restaurant tables on the lower floor to sort out his specimens and try to figure out what these plants were and you all have to remember that the winter up here is no joke, okay? I mean, you have to, a uh, couple decades earlier, the Donner Party had met their unfortunate end just 20 miles south of here at a much lower elevation. Um, and Lemon was, was either snowshoeing or taking a mule when it wasn't too deep, when the snow wasn't too deep, from Sierraville up this pretty rugged canyon down to Weber, um, up to Weber Lake. So, um, so he spent a lot of time trying to um, contact Western botanists and asking them, what are these plants that I've discovered? And the botanists here on the West Coast sort of dismissed him. You know, they said, oh, he's an amateur. Um, and the, the California Academy of Science was just getting started. And they, they sort of dismissed Lemon. So Lemon was undeterred and he turned his eyes east and he started trying to contact other botanists, and the most famous one would be Asa Gray. Asa Gray was a, a botanist at Harvard. Um, he was a very famous biologist in the United States. Um, and Gray encouraged Lemon. He said, you know, I think what you've got here is some novel stuff. And so he basically taught Lemon by correspondence. And you have to remember, this is before um, the rail line was completed. So everything was Pony Express or very slow stages. By this time, by this time, the, the railroad was completed. Well, by the 18th, yes. Yeah, so, um, but, but earlier, the correspondence was pretty slow. Um, another person that he corresponded with was um, another person at Harvard. This is Serena Watson. Um, I just want to show you what one of these specimens looks like. This is... Um, Trifolium, this is clover, essentially. Um, this was collected in Sierra Valley um, at his brother's homestead. Um, and I've sort of zoomed in on the lower right. You can see one of the labels here and it says Trifolium limonii. So Watson named this plant for John Lemon. Um, Lemon had written, this is curious, um, unknown. I don't, I don't know what this thing is. It's got three to seven leaflets and the, the legit JG means collected by JG Lemon. Um, and so this is a cool early specimen of his. Um, and he was sending these specimens all the way back east for um, help figuring out what they were. The other issue we had when we were doing this is there was a lot of correspondence to go through. And this is a letter from Asa Gray to John Lemon. And I defy any of you to read that scrawl. Dad, do you wanna say how we did it? <laughs> Now, I, in the preface of the book, we maintain that there should be three names on the cover as authors, Kelly's, mine, and her mother and my wife, because my, my wife, Sue Agnew, probably spent more time on this book than Kelly and I did combined. I can't tell you how many thousands of letters and reports that were handwritten uh, she deciphered and typed for us. Uh, the book could not have been written if I had had to wade through that. By the time I got through that, I would have forgotten what, I, what, what was on the, on the first page. Uh, the, the, this is uh, Gray's. Uh, Engelman, did you did you still have Engelman's no, letter? I don't have oh, Engelman okay. I, uh, Engelman was probably as worse than Gray did, and oftentimes we were absolutely guessing. But in addition to being our translator, and and literally it was translation and typist, uh, Sue is an extremely uh, a wide reader who has a good ear and a good eye 
and uh, uh, she would make suggestions that I would growl about. But after she left, I would secretly go back and put them in because she was almost always right. Uh, <laughs> She was. So thanks, mom. <laughs> um, so Lemon also did other things uh, botanical in this period. So right now we're in the 1870s, mid 1870s to early 1880s. Um, one of the things he did um, is he went up to Butterfly Valley, which for those of us in California, um, this is in the area that the Dixie Fire just went through. Um, and the Butterfly Valley is this interesting area. Um, it has a plant there that um, isn't found very many other places, um, and it's called a cobra lily. And this is what it looks like. This is a pitcher plant kind of thing. Um, it eats insects. It's carnivorous. Um, and you can see why it was called the cobra lily, because it has this hood, and it's got these two things that stick down that sort of look like a serpent's forked tongue. Um, and Lemon did a lot of self-promotion and he would take specimens and write about them and send them um, out to the rural press and, and, and to other uh, news outlets. And, and here it gets a little bit sticky because what he probably, well, what we know he did is that he was introduced to this place and this plant by a woman named um, Mrs. Miss Ames, uh, Mary Mary Ames, and I'm sorry, this is a bad picture. It's the only one we could find. Um, and she she's the one who knew this plant and was collecting it and was interested in it. And Lemon stole stole her thunder a little bit and and was saying, well, you know, here's this interesting plant. He was the one promoting it, but it was really her who or was she who who knew about it and wrote about it. Um, other things Lemon did, you know, for a man who couldn't work a day in a field. He climbed Mount Lassen and botanized Mount Lassen. Um, he went to the Calaveras big trees area um, and marveled at their giant size. He went down uh, to the- let's go, go back to the big trees. Let me, let me just in, in, in inject here that one of the things that he, he, he did, he, he was in awe of uh, Asa Gray. Uh, Gray was his mentor and God and uh, after seeing the big trees, he wrote an article saying that they date back well before the pyramids. And Gray wrote a letter while he was up at Weber Lake. And in the letter, Gray asked him, are you sure about that? Did you count the rings? Uh, he went back the next year, counted the rings, and decided they were about 1,500 years old and was literally mortified. Yeah. Yeah, because they're not that old. <laughs> they are old, but not that old. So Lemon went down to the Yosemite Valley um, and he went into the high country of Yosemite. This is Cloud's Rest up high. Um, and there, while he was on his way up to Cloud's Rest, he, he ran into John Muir. Um, and he and John Muir formed a long lasting friendship. Um, it would last until Lemon died. Um, Muir did make botanical collections. Uh, most botanists agree they're pretty lousy. He wasn't a very good botanist because um, like his collections will say Yosemite and you're like, well, where? Um, so in fact, this is sort of a famous picture of John Muir with his wife and two daughters um, taken at their home in Martinez before they moved into the big house that we all know now. Um, and this, this photo was taken by John Lemon um, with his camera. Um, some of the other famous botanists that he was um, in contact with, um, one of them was Joseph Dalton Hooker. Um, Hooker was probably the most famous European or English botanist. Um, he was also a, the closest friend of Charles Darwin. Um, and Darwin and Hooker have a long, long correspondence. Um, so this picture is telling for so many reasons. Um, this is Gray and Hooker um, were on an expedition to the West. So Hooker came over from England and Gray and Hooker got on a train and they came West. Um, so there's Hooker and Gray. You can see down here, Gray's got a plant press on his lap. Hooker's got what looks like um, the bracing for a, a frame for a plant press next to his leg. And there are other dignitaries there. Um, there's this one African-American who of course is stuck in the background serving. Um, but this was an important expedition and they went all over California. Um, Lemon accompanied them down to Lake Tahoe. 
um, they came down from Truckee. Um, so let's see, there's Truckee up here. They came down this, um, the route along where Highway 89 is now. Um, and they got on a steamer at Tahoe City and they steamed across the lake over to the Nevada side to Glenbrook. Um, this is actually the steamer that was in service on the lake at the time. Um, we're not sure if it's the one they were on, but it was there. Um, Lemon also climbed up Mount Shasta. Um, if you've ever been up to Shasta, you know it's not for slouches. Um, you couldn't just drive up it back then. Um, it's, it was a pretty serious mountain. He did some collecting there. Um, he took the stagecoach up there. Um, and so all this time he's collecting these plants and he's making these um, collections for sale because he's got to find a way to support himself financially. He wants to send all of this stuff and preferably go to the, ex the exposition in Philadelphia for the centennial. Um, and he wants to start selling specimens, um, but he just doesn't have the financial resources to do it. So as sort of a consolation prize, he decides that he is going to go on a botanical trip through Southern California with another botanist. And on the way, he's going to do library salons and other sorts of uh, educational experiences um, along the coast. And he goes through Santa Barbara. Well, that was fateful because in Santa Barbara, he meets Sarah Allen Plummer. And from this point on, this is really becomes the story of this couple. Um, and so Sarah's uh, originally, um, she's from the East. She came out to Santa Barbara. Um, I'm so glad Wynne Brown is here. She can maybe tell us a little bit about her book that's coming out about Sarah. She's done a wonderful biography of Sarah, um, which will be released soon. So, and she deserves a book in her own right. Um, but this is Sarah. Um, and now I'm going to uh, stop sharing and let dad show you a brief thing on um, from how, how John and Sarah work together and eventually they both decide that they need to be in Oakland um, and they'll get, let's see, I'll let you just take it away from here. Okay. Keep going. In 1900, yeah, John Lemon it. recalled that Oakland was a small village Dad, we're not with seeing a few it. houses You're not. scattered among the oh. Okay, I'm sorry. And Let me go back. When he first saw it in 1866, most of its population of between five and 6,000 was clustered along the San Francisco and the Sarah's, Sarah's story okay, I'm going to really I'm going to start over again. Broadway yeah. seemed to have been a major thoroughfare shaded by California live oaks for which the community was named. Some of the residents' homes suggest the prosperity of their owners, such as that of a Sorry about that. In 1900, John Lemon recalled that Oakland was a small village with a few houses scattered among the sand dunes and thistles when he first saw it in 1866. Most of its population of between five and 6,000 was clustered along the San Francisco and Oakland Railroad. But even then, Broadway seemed to have been a major thoroughfare shaded by California live oaks for which the community was named. Some of the residents' homes suggest the prosperity of their owners, such as that of a Mr. Morse, who seems to have lived in an affluent part of town captured in a photograph from the collection of the Library of Congress. If he had a daughter, she and those of his neighbors may have attended college in what probably was the largest building in the area. Another Library of Congress photograph preserved the image of Oakland's Pacific Female College, established two years before Lemon's arrival. It was located some two miles north of the city's business district on a road that fed into Broadway, near the site where the Victorian Gothic home of J. Mora Moss would be moved in 1912. Lemon's botanizing expeditions seldom took him to Oakland during his first decade in California. That changed in the mid-1870s after he met Sarah Allen Plummer in Santa Barbara. She had a seafaring uncle in Alameda, whom she suddenly decided to visit more often. 
At the same time, John suddenly realized the winters in his high Sierra Valley had become intolerably cold, and its flora no longer offered more plants unknown to science. Consequently, in 1878, he began spending much of his time in Oakland when he was not in the field exploring. By 1880, he was a permanent resident of the city. His new botanical headquarters, he claimed, had become a little city, climbing the abutting hills to peer out through the Golden Gate upon the Pacific Ocean. Since his returns reporting the population growing from 10,500 in 1870 to 34,500 in 1880, ensured that surge of people would soon flow over the crest of the ridge rising abruptly out of San Francisco Bay. Lemon relocated to the Bay Area just as Oakland was building a new city hall at the head of Washington Street. Below it, substantial buildings flanked the wide avenue, and Broadway extended rapidly to the north. John and Sarah married on Thanksgiving Day, 1880, in Oakland and established their first home in the city in a large wing of the Blake House at 12th and Washington. In the next quarter century, the couple contributed significantly to the city's cultural and intellectual development, if not its commercial success. All righty. You have it back? Yep, got it. Um... Okay, so can you see my screen now, Botanical Honeymoon? I see it. Great. Um, so after John and Sarah got married, um, they did a little bit of an unconventional thing for the time. They decided to take a honeymoon that was strictly a botanical thing. Um, and they really were a team um, from this point forward. Um, they were sort of, they had to take the rail lines because um, there just weren't roads available. Um, and so this right here is the Southern Pacific Railroad um, in 1880. And you can see it goes into what was then Arizona Territory and New Mexico Territory. Um, and this is where Wynne really should take over because she knows this better than anybody. Um, but so this is a close up of uh, Southeastern Arizona. Here's Tucson. Um, these are the Santa, Santa Catalina Mountains up here. You see that this one is called Mount Lemon. Um, we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, and just to, uh, down here in the Southeast are the Chiricahuas. Um, and so this is the area that they want to explore. Um, so, Rising above the city of Tucson today, there's this massive mountain called Mount Lemon. It looms over the city. Um, it is called Mount Lemon because it was named for her. She was the first white woman to make an ascent. They tried many times, um, and it's a harrowing tale of how they finally got up there, um, but they did, and they collected plants from the, the summit of Mount Lemon. Um, also, what they did, um, this, here's a picture of uh, the Santa Catalinas with, with one of those peaks being Mount Lemmon. Um, Tucson in 1880 um, was really the Wild West. It, it's what we think of when we think of Western movies and that kind of thing. Um, after they uh, botanized around Tucson, um, they, they waited out the heat a little bit. And then they continued east along the rail line um, out to Fort Bowie. Um, Fort Bowie, this is, this is a picture from about that time. Um, it was established for the U US Army to try and um, quell the uprisings of the Chiricahua Apache. Um, the US government had not kept its promises um, to the Apache and they were regularly coming off the reservation in raiding parties. And so the military installation was there to try and control the Apache's movements as they were going back and forth into Mexico. And um, what the, what it's, this is a little bit insane, but what the Lemons did is they uh, were escorted by the, the, the army out of Fort Bowie. Kelly, first yeah. of all, for the first three weeks, they couldn't leave Fort Bowie because almost all of the troops were in the field trying to capture the Indians and once they were able to get down there, uh, things got even worse. Go ahead. Yeah. 
So the, the military did finally escort them down to this area in um, the Chiricahua Mountains, and they wanted to go into this area called Rucker Canyon. Um, this is crazy. I mean, the, the Chiricahua Apache were, were not to be trifled with. Um, these were very serious raiding parties. Lots of people were killed. Um, this, um, this is one of the war leaders on the left here. This is He. Um, he is one of the uh, Chiricahua Apache um, raiders. Um, and where they were trying to go, where the lemons were trying to go, um, is in this area that used to be a stronghold for the Chiricahua. And this is um, this kind of nice mesa box canyon. It's got this canyon going into this valley. Um, the Chiricahuas themselves are biologically very interesting. They're, they're sky islands. Um, they are sort of these islands of high altitude above the desert floor and plants grow there that grow nowhere else in the world. And so the lemons wanted to go see this stuff. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, and you have to remember for Western science, this, this was completely unknown. Nobody knew what was down there. Um, it's not an easy place to get to. Um, and they were mostly on foot. Um, it, this is one of the specimens. Let me, let me, go, let me, let me just flesh this out a little bit more. There was a hermit uh, living there who had two cabins connected on, on two sides of a, of a ridge connected by a 120 foot tunnel. Uh, the, the, the Chiricahuas went on the war path. They, they were just all over the place swarming. The army informed them they couldn't protect them uh, and they couldn't, they couldn't relieve them. And so they spent the better part of a week in the tunnel, uh, hoping the Chiricahuas wouldn't get them. Uh, the, the crazy old hermit was almost as dangerous as the Indians were. And it, it's just a marvelous story uh, and adventure, it, it seems to me. Go ahead. And, and hopefully Wynne Win can talk about that. Um, maybe you should have Wynne for one of your future talks because I'm sure she has great tales to tell. Um, quickly, because I know we're starting to get close on time. This is, um, this is one of the specimens from that trip. And um, it's important for a number of reasons. Um, this is the Arizona Cypress um, and Capressus Arizonica. Um, and you can see that it says, the collection label says Summit Chiricahua Mountains, 10,000 feet. Um, but what's also, people recognize that this is an important and novel plant. And I just want to focus in on the stamps on here. Um, you can see that this is accession number 56 for our herbarium. We have 2.6 million specimens in our herbarium. This is number 56. It was one of the very first accessions. Um, and you can see from the date that this is right after the herbarium is founded. So it was important enough to get in there really early um, when they were doing it. Um, and this is just another example. This is a fern. Um, this one was actually collected in California up at Weber Lake um, near Sierraville. Um, I want you to draw your attention to the, the collection label where it says collected by J.G. Lemon and wife. Um, you know, sadly, she didn't get her own name on the label, but, um, <laughs> but he, he supported her and praised her through the rest of their marriage. Um, and so at least she's on there. She also has several plants named for her. And at one point there was a genus named for her. Um, okay, so if you're on Telegraph Avenue and you're driving north out of Oakland, um, you know, there's a point after you go under Highway 24 when it sort of opens up and you can see the Campanile up at the, at the, the Cal campus um, on Telegraph. Um, the Lemons moved out of downtown Oakland and they had a house built uh, at 5985 Telegraph. Um, and remarkably, it is still there today. This is what it looked like in the late 1800s. Um, and you can see on the sign, it says lemon herbarium. Please notice there is not much around this house at all. There are eucalyptus trees back there. Bushrod Park is behind it. Um, this is taken standing in Telegraph Avenue. There's a streetcar line that runs up and down um, the middle of Telegraph. And this is the house that they built to house their herbarium. Um, this is what it looks like today. Um, if you're driving north on Telegraph, there's a right before you get to uh, Steele's scuba dive shop. There's also a 
Kentucky Fried Chicken and a Taco Bell there. <laughs> um, there used to be an amusement park and mini golf course, and that's what this um, this <laughs> uh, little windmill is from. It's been tagged with graffiti. That's probably why they repainted it recently. The house it also probably got tagged with graffiti. Um, but there it is. The house is still there. Um, it's been split up into apartment complex or a apartment units, but it is still there. The house is there. Um, this is what the house looked like um, on the inside. This is their herbarium. Um, you can see that they've got all of their pine cone collections up here. Um, you can see that there, there's Sarah and there's John and they've got their specimens back there behind the curtains. Sarah has a drawing on her lap um, and she's working on a drawing of, or a painting of a sugar, a sugar pine cone, the big long ones that you see as you're on your way to Yosemite. Um, and you can see that she's got it hanging from a stick here that she's using as her model and she's making a painting of it. Um, down in front, you see this painting here. This is Darlingtonia. This is the California cobra lily, the, the pitcher plant. Um, and so what, uh, What's remarkable about that, I'm going to back up just really quick, take a good look at that pitcher plant painting. It has survived. Here it is. Um, these two women in this picture, the woman on the left is Amy Kassemeyer. She is the archivist who was hired after I was hired. Um, to, she's done a remarkable job taking care of the collection, getting everything archived. Um, she's been a tremendous help to all sorts of authors and scientists who have come in to use the collection, and she's really good at her job. Um, the woman on the right is Amy St. John, and Amy is the great, great grand, or the great grandniece of um, Sarah Plummer. She is Sarah Plummer's sister's great granddaughter. I think, um, when, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but there's, there's, the, um, there's that painting along with um, Sarah's sketches of California poppy and other poppies. Um, and so they're there, they're still here. Um, this is what the house looked like after they cleared a lot of the stuff out. There's the sugar uh, pine um, cone painting there on the left. You can see this huge collection of pine cones in this old building and this oak paneling is there to, um, protect the specimens. It probably, this is probably the part that was converted to an evangelical church, I think in the 50s or 60s, 1950s or 1960s. Um, um, on the left, dad and I were speculating about this earlier, that's a bayonet hanging down and we think that that is a cavalry saber right there. Probably not his, but it's definitely a, a cavalry saber. Um, so this is uh, so another picture from the interior. You can tell that they're aging. This is probably within a couple years of Lemon's death. Um, you can see again, this crazy fire trap that's uh, all of the, um, the plants, or uh, the pine cones and all of their books and papers and collections all over the place. Um, so they, they lived there until John died and then Sarah was there for the remainder, almost the remainder of her life. Um, sadly, she, after John died, she started to lose her mind. And there are reports of her running out into Telegraph Avenue and attacking a streetcar with a broom um, and that kind of thing. So it was sort of a sad end for her. Um, and this is our last video and then we'll be wrapping up. Kelly, um, let's, let's forego the video. I would, okay. like to, I would like to ask the people that are here, uh, about the last aspect of John's career. Uh, okay. he, he was appointed uh, to the city council in February of 1900, probably because the politicians that ran the city figured that he was fairly naive and could be fairly compliant. Uh, and, and I suspect he was. Uh, he took office just about the time that the water war had come to an end. Uh, there was only one company serving water, providing water to the city, uh, and uh, they were charging fairly high rates, and the, the people got very unhappy, and the politicians lowered the rates without really studying the issue. And uh, the uh, company, the water company, sued the city and won, and there was an extensive trial. And during the trial, uh, Lemon came off as sort of the 
butt of an, uh, an awful lot of jokes. And I never have been quite clear as to what the, the deal was or why. Uh, why. Uh, he seems to have been lured out of town at the time of a critical vote uh, and into the, uh, the, the, the mountains uh, up in uh, what county, Kelly? Um, uh, no, it was in the Sierras. Yeah, and, and anyway, uh, he uh, missed a vote and uh, the court literally erupted in laughter. Uh, this is Mabel Craft Deering, who knew Lemon fairly well. Uh, the Lemons went to her wedding uh, when she became Deering, uh, and uh, she wrote a short story, a fictional short story. I suspect that uh, she's a, a muckraking writer, and I suspect she probably couldn't use the actual names, so she fictionalized it with Lemon just very thinly veiled. And she, she changed the situation around, but uh, Lemon is bamboozled, or, or, or the, the professor in this short story by Deering cap, uh, ca kidnapping the casting vote uh, is, uh, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's depicted as a skeezix. Uh, and uh, I, uh, if I, I investigated this as thoroughly as I could, but if anybody knows what really happened, I would, I would certainly appreciate being informed. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's the, the question about how Oakland's water was supplied, you know, there were initially these private companies and how this boat went down and how Lemon was involved or not involved, um, everybody knew about it at the time, but there's not a good paper trail. And so if any of you know anything about the history of Oakland's utilities and how they were supplied, it would be really helpful. <laughs> if we could figure that out. Um, okay, I think um, that's, that, you know, we have just a little bit of time for questions. Um, we just wanted to wrap up by saying thank you very much for having us here. And I hope you enjoyed learning about John Lemon and, um, and oh, and here we want to plug this really quick. And Wynn is actually here, and I'm so excited. Um, Wynn has just written a biography of Sarah Plummer, and um, it's going to be published by the University of Nebraska Press, and it will be released on the 1st of November. Um, and we're very excited because Sarah certainly does deserve a book in her own right. And um, Wynn, would you like to say anything about that? I don't know if she's muted. Maybe she's not. I think, I, th I think I'm now unmuted. You're, you're, I can hear you. Oh, good. <laughs> this has been terrific because I, I love the fact that the information that the three of you have provided is, is just such a great companion material to the material in my book. And, you know, if, by reading your book and reading my book, I think we we'll really get a very full picture of what a team they were. And um, as you know, as you guys wrote in your prologue, you can't really write about John Lemon without also writing about Sarah because they were just such a really remarkable team. Um, and yeah, my book is coming out uh, November first, um, and um, I'd be happy to you know to to give a talk to the Oakland Heritage um, Alliance, um, and I'll be giving a, a doing a launch, an online launch, and if anybody wants to. To go to my website, winbrown.com, where you can reach me through there, and then um, and see what other presentations I'm I'm doing, which include a lot of material about about John, and for which I relied heavily on your book. <laughs> Great. And you all should know that Sarah was the driving force behind the California poppy being named our state flower. She was involved in the International Red Cross. She was involved in women's <coughs> journalism, um, all sorts of issues. And so she was really a woman ahead of her time. Um, let's see. And we'll just close here and say thank you very much. Um, You're muted, Kelly. Okay, um, so there we go. Um, we have just uh, one question so far. 
Okay. Where, does, uh, where, where does are, are we? Come from? Okay. The one question. Um, so where did their money where, come from? Where did their so, money come from? So Jepson wrote about them after Lemon died, he after John died, and said, you know, they were likable and they were hardworking, but they were impecunious. They they could not save their money. They didn't have two dimes to rub together. They were always sort of working in an angle to get free railroad passes, to do all sorts of stuff. Um, they did sell specimens. Lemon even sold a bet or tried to sell a batch of specimens to President Rutherford B. Hayes of the White House. We have those letters. Um, we know that he corresponded with um, Hayes's son. Um, so they sold specimens here and there. They charged penny admission to their herbarium, um, but they were really just sort of living by the seat of their pants a lot of the time. Lemon, Lemon wrote Maddie at, at one point that uh, five dollars came in and saved them for a week uh just uh, uh, -huh. uh but but they they were almost always on the edge of financial disaster yeah they really were and the remarkable thing about them is that after the new orleans fair which was a sort of a a divide in their careers, uh, they became part of the uh, the social elite of Oakland. Uh, you know, they they went to the best parties, attended the best salons, and uh, were a remarkable couple uh, when you consider that they had virtually no money at all. Uh, they actually homesteaded a. Uh, an allotment uh, in the in the mid eight in the mid eighteen eighties. Uh, they were investing in land, but none of their investments seemed to to pan out. Uh, we have a question from Richard Schwartz. I, I see it. Um, so okay. wow, that's great. A firefighter from Sierraville, um, at the at at Deerwater Field and a budding Lemon Canyon. Um, and so right, if you go through Sierraville, which is basically a T-junction in the road, um, as you're heading out of town toward um, the east, there's a road that goes off called Lemon Canyon Road. Now the sign there is misspelled, it's spelled with one M. Um, and it does eventually wind all the way down into Nevada and enter um, Reno from the north. We're not entirely sure whether the lemons that were in Reno were related to the lemons in Sierraville. It would they seem were likely. they were not, as far as I could tell, by genealogical work. Yeah, we and you know how how common is it to have a two M lemon name? But um, in in our book, we do talk about um, the ranch that's in Sierraville. So as you're coming from Truckee down into Sierraville, you go. It just opens up and there's the post office there um, and um, there's a great Mexican restaurant and on that corner of land that was the Lemons Ranch. Um, it's been developed with a hotel and there's a hot spring spa there now but um, and there's a lot of hay fields there because that's their cash crop. They, they have irrigated pastures and they grow hay. So. And the county just voted to change the spelling of lemon and, and put the second M back in. Oh, in Sierraville? Uh-huh. Great, fantastic. Um, can the public see any part of the lemon collection at the herbarium at Berkeley? Um, yes, you can in normal times. <laughs> um, under COVID, I don't know what the policies are right now for the herbarium. Um, you have to you have to go in and talk to somebody at the front desk, but you um, because they don't let just anybody walk into the back. Um, but if you ask for an escort to take you back, then um, usually they're happy to show the lemon materials. Um, a lot of them are kept in archival drawers because they are sensitive papers and that kind of thing. Um, but you might wanna call ahead and just make sure that under COVID that it's even open. I don't know what their policies are right now with the yeah. pandemic. Um, any record of visitors of note to the Telegraph Herbarium? I don't know. Um, there were lots of people who were movers and shakers in Oakland and, and, you know, they did entertain people that showed up in the social paper a lot, but 
I don't know enough about the social history and the social political work in Oakland to, to really know. Um, so. Sargent didn't go there and, and that swing through the West and, and yeah. that, that really hurt Lemon. The, the fact that you know, he, had, he had collected so much for him and he just ignored him. Yeah, uh, the, the, the fame that got the Tucson Mountain named for uh, her is because she was the first white woman to summit it. And so it was named Mount Lemon, but it's named for her, not for him. Um, and yeah, she, uh, yeah, they did sell, they sold samples from the herbarium to raise money. Um, I'm not sure how much money it made for them. Um, they also had chickens and they sold eggs. <laughs> You know? um, so anyway, I think that's it. But um, if you know, they they do have records of of call. You know, back then people would leave calling cards, and some of those calling cards are there in the herbarium collection. But I don't know enough about Oakland history to recognize them. So um, how long did it take us to write the book? <laughs> Too long. A decade. Yeah, about a decade. Um, uh, I first called dad in 2006 and um, it took a long time. I had a kid and um, <laughs> you know, there's just all sorts of stuff that happened, but we went all over the place. We, my folks <coughs> from Andersonville, I, we all went up to Truckee and Sierraville and we went up the chain of valleys up toward Quincy, which unfortunately right now is under, evacuated. We went through Greenville, which you all know was just destroyed last week um, by the fire. So um, it's- and, 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 and Ann Arbor also. Yeah, they went to Ann Arbor, you know, and it was, it was a process. I mean, it's one of those things, you know, anytime you write a book with somebody, you need to really trust your co-author and, and he's my dad. So, so, you know, it's, it was, it, in some respects, it was very easy. And in other respects, it was really challenging because he's a trained historian. He knows how to write narrative history. I was not trained that way. I was trained as a scientist. We write very differently. We write cookbooks and recipes, you know, how to do this, how to do that. Why is it important experimentally? It's just a very different way of writing things. So, you know, it was a, we, it's a good thing we love each other. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> because when you're working with somebody on something like this, you, you really need to have a lot of patience with them. <laughs> okay, well, I guess we don't have any more questions now. Uh, oh, any chance, any chance of a major lemon exhibit at UC, a poster of that pitcher plant? Oh, I would love to do that. I don't work for the herbarium anymore, but I think... Oh. I think that would be great if they could do that. Um, I'm actually teaching now all the time, um, but they do have uh, uh, display windows set up right across from the maw of the T-Rex and we could put those things up and I think that would be lovely. I think we should suggest that to the folks at the herbarium. Yeah. You buy your book on Amazon. <laughs> Sorry, I know it's the evil empire, but um, on Amazon, you can just Google John Gill Lemon or our names and it, it will come up on Amazon. Okay, still don't see any more questions. So well, thank thanks a lot. I really enjoyed this and it's a very interesting subject. I really appreciate you two coming to give a, a lecture on, on this and the many aspects involved. It's very interesting. Yeah, it was our well, pleasure. Our yes. pleasure, absolutely. Okay. All right, well, thank you everybody. I'm gonna yeah. sign off now and go feed the dog. <laughs> okay. So we've got our walking tours coming back starting this weekend. And we've, we've got the historic North Field on Sunday and then Amelia Marshall on the Ridgetop Redwoods, and, on, and then uh, Stu, Stu Swidler on Shepherd Canyon and Tales of the Tunnel, and a total of seven tours uh, running into late September. So purchase tickets today. And uh, also become a member. There's benefits such as uh, supporting historic preservation. Uh, we have a newsletter that comes out 
approximately three times a year. And uh, we have these lectures. Uh, we used to have them in person and now they're online and we're starting up the walking tours again. And every so often we have a nice house tour with about seven tours inside uh, about seven houses to go inside seven houses. So uh, thanks again. Uh, and uh, please support uh, Oakland Heritage Alliance. Thanks, Charles. Good night, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Good night. Thank you for coming, everyone. Yes, that was good. Thank you so much. This was great. I win. Bye. Let's get together at some point. <laughs>